it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing, back with another guest. This is Guilherme from Cannabud. I'm uh, really excited to talk with him. He's got a very unique offering in the cannabis marketplace. Um, it's called Cannabud. Um, it's a software specifically for cannabis cultivators. Really excited to hear more about it, as well as Guilherme personally. How are you doing, Guilherme? I'm doing uh, well. Thank you, Samuel. And thank you for, for inviting me. It's like... It's always a pleasure to talk with uh, smiley faces like you, and and thank you so much for for having me here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah, but go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, really excited to hear more about what you do. And so, uh, really, before we jump into Cannabot, uh, tell me a little bit more about you yourself personally. Yeah. So basically, like when I was a kid, I wanted to be uh, an inventor. That's what I always say because I I knew I wanted to create stuff, but I didn't know how yet uh like every kid that doesn't know what to do like i went to college for management in the in the that's what the average guy in portugal that doesn't know what to do goes to management and then i didn't get to management actually uh, because my grades were not that uh, good like for some points i went to marketing management and then like i didn't know what was marketing by then and then I started to to go on the course and starting to, to make some like projects and everything. I was like, well, this <laughs> we can create some fun stuff here. So basically, I went to to, to college in in marketing uh, my, as a bachelor, and then I went to uh, to start trying things. So uh, like while I was still in college, I was like in a nuclei, like I was in a startup selling uh, like uh, RFID blocking wallets. Like I was trying to put uh, things to practice while I was learning. And then basically my career has been like I started in marketing management of a small startup. And then while I was working in this marketing day to day basis of like uh, what you what you do and so well, like of uh, SEO, the websites and uh, like uh, cold calling, because the startup I was at was like a, a music classes marketplace. So I had to find teachers, I had to find students and, and, and make that jiggle. Um, and then we started to make an app in the for this uh, startup. And then I, I was involved in this process of uh, like I was behind the app. I knew the flows. I was talking with the developer. And I was like, well, making tech is actually nice too. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to quit from uh, marketing to tech. So I, w- I went on to, uh, to be a project manager at the software house. I don't know how they hired me, but I, I was happy they did. <laughs> and, and then they, I, I had the project manager uh, and product manager uh, job at the same time. So I was managing um, uh, e-commerce for restaurants in the COVID time. So it was like awesome. <laughs> and I was like all the developing process, designing new features, listening to the, the customer and everything. I was very happy with that job. And then there were some changes in the management and I went on and I thought, well, let's pursue this project management uh, life. And I went to a payment provider company. So I went all in on the tech uh, side of it. I was there for three months and it was uh, the biggest company I I was at. And I thought, well, I'm here and I'm liking it, but let's go to uh, like, let's do what I always wanted uh, to do. And in the last moments of my career as a worker, like uh, when I was still in the software house, I met Juan, which was one of the original co-founders of Cannabis. And basically, we started to 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 go to contests and to make to go to hackathons. And then he moved to another company, I moved to another company, but we kept that team of uh, doing hackathons going. And then we found Andre, which is like one of the hires of Juan at the time. And then there was like, he's our CTO now. He was like, he went on to do the hackathon and hackathons. And basically by the time we opened the company, uh, we we had one, uh, I think four or five hackathons. And then we were like, let's do it. We will we'll find a way of making this work. We opened the software house and we didn't know like uh, we were going to tackle cannabis, uh, to be uh, uh, honest. When we opened the software house, we knew we wanted to tackle a big uh, challenge. At the time, we were thinking about making an AI to optimize ads. So it's like it's a you are very deep into that uh, work of having to optimize the contents, so of having to optimize the keywords, like the everything. And we wanted to make an AI for that, and we started to build it. And then we talked with an investor, and he said, "Well, this idea is nice, but if Google blocks the API, you're gone. If Facebook blocks the API, you're gone." And we were like, "Well, that's true. We need something that has value from the core." Um, and then we had this thing of Andre, uh, his family, they have a, a, they are, they have a pre-licensed cannabis facility here in Portugal. 
And the, internally, they challenged Andre to make a software for that. But at the time, Andre only had like two months of work experience. He was like, of course, I can't do this. Like, I have never worked before. But... So when we opened the company, we, we like we had this idea of the marketing. And then we want, when we wanted to pivot, like around the sitting at the three month mark of the company, we drawn 551 ideas on the board, like crazy ideas. I mean, automatic bots, like crazy ideas. And then we look at one that looked actually like one that we could pursue because uh, the thing about this cannabis industry is like we, we felt it is truly underserved. And from the Andres experience, family experience finding software, they felt it was a hard challenge. So we, we thought, well, why not? We started to do research and well, now, now we're here to more than two years later and it's still, still going. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're oh, yeah. a true entrepreneur by nature. I, I was I was checking you out. Um, I, I, we've been connected on LinkedIn for a little while. And I, what really caught my attention was, I think it was the last week, you were talking about your journey at the start of Canapub and how you got your first big sale after one year. And I was just thinking, it was like, wow, that, that guy has some serious willpower to sit in there for a whole year without getting the income he needs. And I'm really curious, uh, what, what what that moment was like, that, that whole year where you were just going without getting any sales. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, it was it was a, a rough uh, journey because it had two sides of it. It had an internal side of it and it had an external side of it. Because internally as a company, as a software house, we, were, we, we had income. Like we never found investment because we always find ways of finding money to cheap on cannabis. But... Like that early year, it's very like in, initially I was just drawing uh, uh, mockups and uh, diagrams and I, I never saw a cannabis plant in my life. So I was just like that early stage was very like learning, learning, understanding that I didn't know shit. <laughs> Excuse my French. I don't know if this podcast is. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking cannabis. All right. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, basically it's. Um, um, and I for, with this joke, I forgot where I was. <laughs> oh, we were like, talking what, what about Canada Blood, the one year of the darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and that early side was like we were making mockups and we were already programming and we had some assumptions. And uh, we actually did something that was very crazy. And I think that this is a very fun story because with the first guys, we started to start selling the software as, as quick as possible, like. We had a, a rough uh, MVP, we had a Figma, and we were ready to go. So the first demonstrations were actually like, we, thought, we told the guys, well, this is the dream. And we showed them Figma. Like, this is a dream, like, this is what we wanted to go. We were showing, we were like very interested. And at the, at the moment, I, I stopped the Figma demo, and I told them, now let, let me show you the real stuff. And then I opened the back office, like the IP was like, it's still a development environment, like errors everywhere. But you, you, I, I was, I was selling the people the, I was not selling the software. I was also selling them the story of the progression of the, the software, because that, it was the first time they saw it. And then if three months later, they saw the software again, the reality would be already way further. Like six months after I was not showing the Figma anymore. Like, Eight months after, I, I was telling, oh, we now I have clients on this. So basically what made this initial phase less of a winter was like this uh, um, uh, journey of talking with people, showing them stuff, learning, and then m like going on and building on top of their feedback. So that kept me going and, and kept us going until we had, uh, until we started having clients. And then basically it, like, it went from August uh, around August 2022 to June 2023, where we had our first uh, client. And even that first client, we started talking with them like in March. So the when we presented the software, it was like, it, it was also, uh, I, I, won't, I don't like the expression, fake it till you make it, but it's like, make it uh, rough until it looks good, but it makes it. <laughs> but, um, because the fake it, it was not fake. It was our, our real software, but the parts that we were developing and that we were showcasing were the ones that were well thought and, uh, and not, we were not going into the patch that we knew were going to have problems in the software, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. That's been the first year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, let's jump into this because I'm really curious to learn more about it. And anybody listening um, who runs a cannabis cultivation operation, what are the main things that they're looking for? What are the main solutions that you offer them with Cannabis? Yeah. So basically, this depends a lot on the what stage of the of the facility you are. And this is something that we took a, a, a little while to understand. So when you are a pre-licensed facility, 
you still are building stuff and you don't know very much what's compliant. So what you look in a software, sometimes it's not exactly what we offer because you want software, but you also want uh, know-how and you want consulting services that help you to find out what, what you need. And for us, this is kind of hard because this means that in these early um, licenses, the pre-licenses, they often choose worse softwares that have a more knowledge base and that gives them this uh, compliance side of it. And then as the, the, like you have your first li license and then you start growing and the first years you start growing, you start to understand because you are doing it on pen and paper that making errors, they cost a lot, you know, like errors, like a guy for like uh, shifting a nine or for a six, it will cause you problems. And, and if you have more clients, you start to stack up paper, paper, paperwork, and it's, it gets very, very burdensome. Uh -huh. So at, at the middle when you are starting out, you said, well, I will have a problem with paper. And then at the end, when you are running for, I don't know, six, seven years, which is the example of our first client, and we are lucky to have a client on, on that uh, end of the spectrum, then the problem starts to become, I have 50 guys in this company. Like, I need to, to, to make sure that this product is going to be dispatched. I need to know, and I need to start to optimizing the processes. Like, what is everybody doing? How the processes connect with it, each other? And how, how to make our operation work? So what we offer, basically, is we offer the full suit. And we, and we do that because we started with the pre-licenses. And then we, like, as they... They were, we were learning from them and they became licensed. We learned from them. And then as they grow, we, we learn from them. And now we have the whole suit. So basically, we have in the beginning, you can have your inventory. You can put uh, your plants, your strands. Uh, you can register, make some recipes of, uh, of uh, your mixes that you are going to put in. And that's the part where mostly the pre-licenses work on. So they are setting up their operation, making some tests, tests here and there. But they are not quite having operational problems by then. Then... When once the thing starts to be real, more, more real, you have all the things about printing the stickers. Uh, you can customize your sticker and make a st stickers for plants, sticker for for I don't know for the badge for the waste. You can put stickers e everywhere. Like we have stickers for everything. You can put the sticker on the room. I mean, you can't put stickers on people yet, but uh, you can stick. Every uh, make sticker put stickers everywhere, and then you have like this uh, numeration of the batch where you say like what are the rules of numerating a batch? So the batch starts with the initials of the strand and then blah blah blah, and you can set up all of this compliance. And this compliance also, what it makes is everything. Every time you are registering something on the software, you are logged in, and this goes into an audit trail. So you everything you do on the software is always being recorded and. If you do it on the batch, it will stay on the batch record forever. If you do it on the room, it will stay on the room batch uh, record forever. And that's what we offer for middle-sized companies or the ones that are growing now. And then at the end of the spectrum, we have a solution that fits all of these stages, which is our process and test manager. And to simplify, it's basically uh, you, you have a process. Like imagine you have a process of, I don't know, um, like you can make a huge process, a process of, for example, a batch. It's a huge process. It's like a project. We call it a project. And then you can make tiny projects with tasks inside it. So you can say that this is you have the vegetative project, you have the flowering project, you have the post harvest project. And then you can put tasks on all of this. And you're just making like a template, okay? And then you can just say, well, this task starts one day after this start task ends. And this task ends after this task starts. And to that, you can say, this one really blocks this one. So nobody will be able to start this one until this one is made. And then you put the assignees, like what, what are people going to be supposed on that, doing on that test? And then you put where you are going to put the... Uh, so every process, everything that happens in facility, you have a way of writing uh, a, 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 like a process for that. And then you're just doing the template. When it comes goes to reality, you just say, okay, I want to start this project and I, I want this batch to be delivered on... Uh, next February, or I want this batch to start on this February. And based on all of this, those rules that you set up, it starts after that, and blah, 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 you put a whole Gantt that basically makes the production for the whole year. Like it's it's as crazy as a huge Gantt that uh, tracks everything. And then you have the planned date, the real date, and then the predicted date, because you had a lot of time setting up all those relationships. And you can start to see when things start to go wrong, you can see, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This, action here it derailed our our delivery for two months and then you can start calling your client 
And basically, this like uh, these are are the sort of uh, solutions that uh, we offer. And yeah, basically, that's that's it. <laughs> yeah, you spoke to some pain points that dispensary owners and cannabis operators have that I I think that you have a great solution for. And I'd like to kind of follow up on that. So, but one one thing that you were talking about was. Yeah, they get to the point where they are just doing a ton of paperwork and it's just like, oh, man, I just don't want to do this paperwork. Uh, can, can you tell me what, what would be the first project that people would put on Canada to kind of help simplify and automate? Usually, what would you say? Um, basically, like the, the thing is currently it like uh, it won't save. So when I talk about paperwork here, it's like we have these bad records where you have to write everything you do. And, yeah. and this, like you read this, right? I did this, I did this at this time. And I, and this is a lot of inputs that you need to put by hand. So basically just by replacing that for a, an input where you log in, you're just taking away the guy doesn't need to t tell who he is and he doesn't need to tell at what time it was made because it's, it's written there. So basically like it helps you uh, like in that part of, uh, of saving paperwork because you're not making errors. And then it's it's not about like it's all about replacing the paperwork you are using and the systems you are making your paper based systems with uh, digital systems. It if if you have a compliant needs for like if you need to deliver to your uh, I don't know compliance agency a stack of paper at the end of the day you're going to need to deliver that stack of paper. But the thing is all that data that you are going to put there. It doesn't. It's not coming from humans. It's coming from a system because all of this data that we are putting on our on our system, we can export. And each client, they have their different needs. So, for example, this process part, we we can export it for you to put in Power BI. So each department have their own dashboards to see where things are going. So basically, like I would say that the first things people register on Cannabis when they are starting. It's like, what do I need to do to get my license? So it's a task list of everything that I need to do to accomplish uh, my, my license. So I need to talk with this guy and I can say, I need to talk with this supplier and I can register the supplier and say, I need to talk with John. I need to talk with uh, Charles, you know. I need to make this there. I need to deliver this, uh, this specific piece of paper to this location. So all of these actions that you, you could, uh, um, that you need to, to make something compliant or to, mandatory actions, you can put it on, on a Gantt and you can start to manage it as your task uh, manager because at the end of the day, you're putting a whole bunch of tasks that are going to go to on a Kanban board. So you're just going to drag to do, to doing, doing, to done. So yeah, basically every task that you need to to, to remember of doing and you can start to put it in on Kanban. Yeah. yeah, this is really interesting. It's kind of like an all-in-one suite for uh Lots of things. Um, so I'm really interested to kind of dive into a little bit more of this. Um, so how does your software integrate with existing cultivation systems and equipment? Is there any automations there? Yeah, basically we are still, um, we haven't connected with a lot of systems yet. And basically this, when we started to make Cannabis, we really make a deep uh, market research. Um, and, and we saw that most of the softwares, they don't really say, oh, we'll come in and integrate with you. Don't worry about that. Normally what they do is, oh, damn, you need to buy all oh, this pack of, uh, of uh, equipment that is integrated. Otherwise, we'll need to chart. And we don't like this approach. Like we have the hackathon approach. So what we do is we make a proposal, we go in, and we integrate with whatever is necessary. Like with the first time we did this, it was not with a client. It was a prospect for us. And we just literally, we went there, we spent there two days inside the tent, inside their warehouse, like the programmers programming. Uh, I was just like uh, seeing how everything was going, but I, I must be honest, I was not programming the integrations, but we had all of the printers there and we were testing and testing and testing. And in two days, we, we integrated uh, their scales, their printer, and they, the data from it, their HVAC system. So basically, how do we handle this at this time? It's still a very, very, in, in, I don't know what, naive uh, approach. But we say, we can integrate with it. Don't worry. We've been there. We've do, we did hackathons. Worst case scenario, your system is not integratable. Don't worry. We can put a, a camera on pointing to a screen with some type of OCR object and objection detection uh, algorithm, and we'll get the data. Like, nobody can take the, way the, the data away from us. So basically, this is our approach by now, and it works very well because people 
they, there's already a lot of friction to adopt a new software and they don't feel that the sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars that they spend on, on their equipment, it's going to waste. It's not because we'll find a way of putting the data in Canada. And then this will feed, like uh, if it scales, it will feed every action that has uh, some scaling activity. It's integrated with the scales. Uh, the printers, you design the printers on our software and then you send it to, to, to a printer. Uh, you so design the, the printer levels, it is. And and also like the H, like all of those sensors and everything, they write the the sensor information to the batch and to the room. So every the data is connected basically. Yeah, well, let's, let's dive yeah. into a little bit more of the data. I'm, I'm confused, excuse me, I'm excited to learn more about that. Um, and so you're talking about like the reporting and the dashboard and all that stuff. What, what kind of data do you normally have on your dashboard and your reports? What, what do you normally see on your end? Yeah, basically you have a, uh, uh, what you have is there is almost no data that you you don't have here. So basically, you know when the seed was uh, put on the ground, like what was the supplier, how many time it spent in the warehouse, like uh, at exactly what hour at the day it was put on the ground, like the temperature of the room. So you have all the data regarding like every action that was made, every measurement that was made. And basically everything that people register or the machines register. So we have all of this data. And basically what this shows in terms of normal dashboards, normally it's more like reconciliation stuff. So you can see at the batch, well, we are not uh, losing any weight here, so we are good. Or uh, this percentage of waste uh, is, uh, is from contaminated plants or this is from... Uh, I don't know, from pruning. So you have all of this data of categorization of the waste you make, of the actions you make. You also have the observations. So we have this mobile app where you can just take pictures of, uh, of, the, of the plant and say, well, there's a aphid here, or it's getting yellow, it's getting red. So basically all of this data, it's existing in, in, in the platform right now. But at this moment, we are giving the dashboards to help you manage the batch. We are giving you the, the dashboards to, to see the conditions and everything. But we are still not in the AI phase of our name. So we are not yet correlating all of that data to make some intelligence, uh, intelligence from it. For two reasons, because it's very delicate data and people really need to make sure that uh, we are saving their data. That's our big, one of our biggest concerns. And the thing is the amount of data, because we still don't have a lot of clients. And if we, if we made a, an algorithm right now, and this goes the part where I learned a little bit about statistics in my statistics master. If we did an AI with a shitty data, the AI will not, would just be a A. <laughs> the, a the I will not, will not be there because you don't have enough data. So that's basically the data that runs into our system and what you can do with it. Yeah. But another thing I'm curious about, this is a really good answer, really good thoughtful answers. You're kind of actually, I have a list of questions here and you're helping me scratch <laughs> off some of them with, with your really thoughtful answers. So I appreciate that. Uh, but Thank you. <laughs> one thing I think I'm curious about, um, can you also work with other types of cannabis operations? And so obviously cannabis cultivation is one of your big, it's your bread and butter, but what other kind of cannabis operations do you work with? Do you work with dispensaries too? We currently don't work with dispensaries because of uh, regional limitations. Because to be honest, in a, in a perspective of a Portuguese startup, going to the US now, uh, like as we are, it's going into a mature uh, market that has mature players and, uh, and has a different compliance than what we have here in Europe. Yeah. If we do the other way around, if we do a European system that is, uh, that is able to be very strict, but at the same time relaxed, it's easier than to go to the US because we are making a European grade uh, system, a GMP uh, friendly system that that when goes to the to the US is more like of a of a strong it has a stronger brand. But we actually we are working with other types of operations, not just cannabis uh, cultivators. Cultivators here in Germany, we are not in Germany, but he, in Germany. Um, we, there is a, like the market is growing and we have these social clubs now. So what we are doing uh, is we have some German partners and what we are building with them is a, a kind of an ecosystem where we are connected as a cultivation system, but we are connected with uh, different membership um, um, uh, softwares, with all types of softwares, so we can be integrated in the ecosystem. And this way we can, uh, in a way, we can help cultivators 
But as, as I talked with you about that task module thing, it can go beyond, uh, like we haven't tested it yet, but it can go beyond what's inside your cultivation. Like if you give access to your supplier, he would have his tasks related to you there. You know, If you have a consultant that is working uh, on your company and he can start to make templates of processes for you, or we can have, if we have like uh, social clubs, we can have a social club that has a guy there that built a whole process and then he can sell that template to another social club. Yeah. So what we have uh, around processes uh, in this industry is limitless right now. We are just basically what you see of us focusing on cultivation is we still need to prove ourselves as somebody that makes great tech and cultivation is the way that we could start at because at the moment we started, there were no uh, social clubs on site. So we had to start with the things that were legal around us and where we could leverage our local presence. And Portugal is the biggest exporter of medical cannabis in uh, in the European Union. So for us, Portugal, like we are already here, it's like it, it makes a lot of sense to go on that on that direction. But our vision for the long term is just it, it's to kind of uh, be like this is a bold statement. It's like kind of the tech Google of cannabis, you know. So you need tech for cannabis, and you know that these guys they are they have been around the ecosystem and they've built a platform that connects it all. So th this is the, basically the, the the vision. But of course, this is an industry that it's not moving usually fast right now, and it's a compliance uh, heavy industry. So it takes time to get there. But uh, like summing it up. We, we are very happy to work besides cultivation, but now it's like what we can uh, hold on to. <laughs> yeah, and I think we were kind of talking before we started recording here about how it's Europe's a really growing market. So I'm sure you're anticipating for that. And so uh, following up for my next question on that point, um, how scalable is Cannabud for large scale op operations? Uh, what do you mean? Like, uh, so say you know you're working with uh, a smaller business, less than one million dollars in revenue. You can help them out a lot, but maybe you're working with a hundred million dollar, a one billion dollar company. Um, how scalable are your operations and your systems for them? Basically, it's already ready to to go f straight for the one billion dollar company because the thing is like our system won't uh, replace the intricacies of your own organization. You know. Like our system will help you navigate your processes and communicate inside like your company and making sure that the things go meet an end. But the only thing I can see it getting very cluttered in terms of scalable is the task part where you have a lot of people, you have a lot of um, uh, different tasks that are in, in like related with each other. But the bigger the company is, the most the more uh, resources they also spending on planning and on making sure that the workforce is organized. So we don't we don't believe we are not ready to go for a one billion uh, uh, dollar company. Actually, we would talk with the with one of the biggest in the in the world, and when we pitch them and we pitch what pains we were solving. The the answer was, oh, my God, like it looks like you guys have a spy here because you're just speaking to the core of our biggest problems, you know, because it, it sits on the when I was talking about the pre licenses, the fresh license in the, the end spectrum, like the problems of uh, their problems are more are, are very human problems or communicative problems or deadlines that are not being met. And for them, we also we made a solution specifically for them. So I believe we are limitless on that. Thing, but we need to find a huge facility to prove us wrong. <laughs> that, that's awesome. It sounds like you actually already got an endorsement from a potential partner, you know, a billion dollar company. I have a couple more questions for you, then uh, just a few more fun ones if you can stick around for five, ten more minutes. Um, yeah. So one of them is kind of a big elephant in the room. And so you, you were dancing around a little bit ago is it's compliance. And so how do you handle compliance and what, what are the major areas of compliance? So maybe be laws, data. What would you say and how do you do that? Yeah, basically compliance is um, is one of those things that like uh, it's very easy for a, an entrepreneur to be scared by compliance, and that happened to us in the beginning. Like we were scared by compliance because we thought we are not compliant. Oh my God, what we are going to do? Like how are we going to handle this? We are fucked. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, like we kind of embraced these flexible times where we are now because we are not a software that is compliant right now. And we are playing with it because 
The thing is, there are softwares that are not compliant right now, and they are selling themselves as softwares that are compliant. And then when the shit hits the fan, like the, your credibility goes off like that, because you say one thing and then you do the other. So we admit that we are not validated at the moment. What we have is we have one facility here in Portugal that is is telling the authorities that they are using our software and they are going and they are telling the authorities, well, what do I need to, to make this happen? And then they send what they need and then we send them responses and then we build ourselves around compliance because compliance is all about uh, writing what you do uh, and, and doing what you, you write. And although the system can help you a lot, it is a, a very important part of it, the compliance is very, very, very attached to the facility itself. And because our system is like this sandbox of processes and, and uh, you are building your own processes, my system is not, is not uh, compliant and it will never be if your pro internal processes are not yeah. compliant. Yeah. So basically, th this has been our approach. Like we, are, we do first and if, like when the validation comes, we will be ready to it. And if somebody starts to make any validation efforts with us, like, oh, we need this documentation for this, or we need to make sure that you are doing this, we go all in. If we uh, we can spend an all nighter writing that down and say, well, it's here. What we need more, like, and then they say, oh, we need more of this, and it, we do it. And then we'll just keep tackling uh, uh, compliance as is, because I mean, this is the for us. It has been the way of making sure that you are not lying. <laughs> You are building a system, you are being transparent, and you are actually doing something that it has no reason not to be compliant because the system is already very transparent with the audit trail and everything. So it's we are ready to go in terms of compliance. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, one more question about Canva, and then I'd like to jump into something a little bit more fun. Um, and so looking yeah. forward to the next year, two years, three years, what are your biggest plans? What, what are you excited about? Are you developing a new product offering, um, something alongside what you're already doing? What, what would you say? Yeah, so basically, um, we, are, we, are, we are still in the stage of making the core system. So the core system is, is finished now, so there's, you can work it end-to-end, -end, but it, 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 it still hasn't seen, for example, a production harvest. Like we haven't, we tested, but we didn't have a facility running their full harvest through us. Um, we, had a, we have facilities doing the cultivation and they are going to reach the harvest very soon, maybe in, in some months, but we haven't still uh, reached that point. So we want to kind of wrap up that part of the system as the core of it, as Canabud as a, as, a, as a system. And then we'll have some things on the, on the sleeve because this industry and the, the most important thing about this industry, it changes overnight. It's very fast and you need to be flexible because if you are not you are going to get caught up. So we have a lot of plans for the future. Of course, we want to, uh, if we have the data, we'll make the intelligence about the, the um, in the data. We want to bring our uh, mobile app to the level of the back office because now it's just an observation and labeling thing. And we want to, to you to engage more with the app to register stuff and everything. And then basically it's like everything around uh, uh, cannabis, like, cultivation like education is a possibility that will that will reach like even home growing is a possible is something that we we want to to go in so we we kind of i can't tell you what's the future like because if you ask me uh, one or two years ago like the reality and the expectations they didn't match so we keep going and and the uh, we need to, it's not about knowing the destination it's about navigating you know you you yeah. you'll reach somewhere yeah. Um, and basically, we don't like to say that we have all of these big plans for the future, because if things go wrong, they'll never become true. But if things go really well, our vision is just to keep building more and more and more tech. And every problem that needs, that we still have in this industry, like being it transparency problems, being it communication problems, being any problem that can be solved by, by technology, we want to be there and make sure that we have a solution for it. And the problems will start coming and we don't know what problems we'll have tomorrow. So we'll be ready to tackle them tomorrow. But right now it's just finishing um, the, the operational side of the system because the system is good if you are on a computer, you can register everything and we are making it easier to use on the operation. Basically, this is the next uh, uh, part of it, yeah. Yeah, I like how you're really <laughs> transparent about your stage, uh, where you're at, where you're going, uh, what, you, what you think you could be doing better. Um, and I think that's really awesome. I think that's also probably helped you a lot with your sales too. Um, once again, this is Guillermo Guilherme Tavares. I'm 
butchering his name. I'm not a Portuguese. <laughs> uh, but no he has a Perfect. website uh, called cannabud.ai. We'll definitely leave that in the description below. I have a few more questions. They're more fun for a little bit more fun. Um, you don't have to answer them if you don't want to. Uh, but first things first, can you tell me about the first time you used cannabis? Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a fun story because, like, um, I had this uh, fami family. Uh, the fa my family thought that this was a dangerous. Uh, this devil's lettuce. It was a dangerous. Yeah. Plant. <laughs> uh, and and I was like, well, if this is a dangerous plant, I need to get to college because I can't mess it up until then. So I was. I, I'm a very curious guy, and I was like, I really. I think I will like this plant, but I, I can't. I can't mess up my my future. So. It was in the summer where I, I went, I already knew I was in college that I went on and to, and I, I asked a person that I knew, can, can you get me some joints? And then I went to a, a, a house of one of my friends and we smoked it in, the, in, the, in, the, in his garden. And we actually have a video of that moment. It's very cringe worthy uh, video of us trying to smoke cannabis and we didn't even know how to, to make it go through our lungs. But yeah, that's kind of my story. It was a very deliberate and uh, uh, scientific experiment. And yeah, that's that was the first time, yeah. Did you feel it the first time? I did. Yeah, I didn't. But you were like, in the video, you were like, oh my God, man, we are so high. And it was like, <laughs> damn, we are. <laughs> so now yeah. that you're a little bit older and more experienced, what's your favorite cannabis product? It's it's here in Portugal. Like we still uh, we have mostly flower, and I mean we have ash as well. But I, I'm in my personal thing is to stick with the with the flower. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there you go. And then one yeah. more question. Uh, looking into your crystal ball, knowing what you know, um, just seeing what you've been seeing. What's the future of the cannabis industry? <laughs> that's a that's an awesome uh, question. Uh, I think the future is, uh, it depends a lot on uh, like who, who will uh, hold the future, you know, because like we see this, uh, um, this industry can go in a lot of directions. And we see that it went into a one direction, very commercial side of, of it in the US and it had a huge boom. And now it, it's having this problem of uh, like some, it's maybe it, it was too much. And now we, some uh, businesses are dying. It can go on the pharma side, which also makes sense because although it's very, uh, you feel, oh my God, the, the big pharma, like uh, the truth is the the processes they went to to make sure that the, the, the final product has quality and it is sold as uh, what's there. Like it's important that we have this type of, uh, of, uh, of check. So I think the future of, of the industry as a whole, uh, it's unknown. <laughs> I, it's 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 probably going to grow because we see the, this global um, mindset changing. Like most of the countries are changing, um, I think we can we're going to see more of like what's the global distribution of cannabis. Because if you're looking at the global scale, like Canada or the US, they are not producing vegetables. They are not the world producers of vegetables. So if you're looking at the future of an industry, it's not to expect that uh, the, these crops will be grown in very uh, in rich countries where we have a lot of energy costs. So I think what we are going to see in the next years is going to be like this industry getting settled down more on the global distribution networks, like producers that uh, the produce in Africa or South America, and you see it going across the, the, the world to, to reach better product at a, at a lower price. So I think the, the, the future of the industry is like, we are going to see this all logistics uh, and the supply chain being built because at right now it's still like very fragmented lines. And I think that's the, the fun part about the, the industry for uh, at the, technological point of view because it will need so much technology that we ah. <laughs> yeah, great prediction i like that one uh once again this is you there Thomas. Uh, do you have any last minute pitches for the audience no i just thank you to if you are watching this for for this uh, whole time thank you for for this time and thank you samuel for for having me here and it's been a, a fun chat thank you very much likewise i'll definitely be following you staying in touch with you i'm excited to watch you grow some more but uh, thanks again for being on the show Definitely wish you all the best. Thank you very much. <laughs>